There's a great verse in uh, Psalm 71 that uh, I used to, when, it, when I'd preach to a group of older people in some setting where everybody was old and gray, I would uh, use it as a challenge verse for them, but now I, uh, I, I kind of have arrived at that spot where the verse applies to me. I'll, I'll read it for you, but this is, uh, this is my prayer. And, and even when I am old and gray, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come. So hopefully, uh, if, the, if the Holy Spirit is coming to, to bring these words into your heart, we'll accomplish this this morning. It really is the only possibility for anything useful to come out of standing up here and speaking is that the Spirit ta takes the words and brings them deep down into someone's heart and, and uh, brings the power uh, of the life of Christ to explain something and, and convict and challenge and encourage and heal. And that's what we need to go on here this morning is the Spirit of life, the, the Spirit of revelation will speak to you. So let's just take uh, 20 seconds and you ask that spirit to, to bring his message to you this morning. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, speak this morning to, to each one of us the, the specific word that that will draw us close to you in this new year in a way that we have not known before. Teach us great and, and mighty things. We thank you. We proclaim you to be our Lord, and we praise and worship you this morning with our hearts. Amen. Well, there's a, a, a little story uh, about my grandfather. I, I don't remember a lot about my grandfather on my dad's side. He lived in Minnesota and we lived out here in Idaho, but we'd see him for a few days uh, every two or three years. And uh, one day I was in his backyard with him in Minnesota. A bunch of the older cousins were playing football in this uh, big field behind the house, and, and I was a bit small for the size of guys that were playing. So I was standing there, I, I think I was about nine years old, and I was with my grandfather and uh, just uh, standing watching the football. And this one little cousin, a, a little girl about three or four years old, was just absolutely uh, in, a, in a tizzy fit and crying and laying on the ground and kicking the ground. and and moping and groaning and, and my grandfather tried to say several nice things to her and every time he, he spoke she'd just scream some more and kick the ground and cry and, and you know there wasn't anything she needed and she wasn't hurt but she, she just she wanted something and uh, I think he, he figured it out and, and uh, he instead of saying something more he, he went over and picked her up and, and uh, put her up to where her head was on his shoulder, and it, and it took about three seconds for her to just lay her head down and go to sleep right there. And, and you know, she was comforted. She had, she had received what she needed. And uh, my, my grandfather looked at me and, and winked and, and said, uh, she wants, she wants, she don't know what she wants. And, and I think uh, that, that's really the story uh, of so many lives. Uh, uh, I, I know it was the story of my life. I, I, I didn't really know. I d it didn't even occur to me that I was trying to fulfill some deep desire inside, some, something that uh, felt empty need, needed to be found. And I looked in all sorts of places to find it, you know, we, we look at success and we look at jobs and educations and romance and toys and on and on and on. Uh, there, there's a great 
uh, song recently written by Zach Williams, and, and uh, there's a line in it. Uh, the name of the song is, I was looking for you. But the, the line is, uh, I couldn't name the hunger that I tried to satisfy. And I, I think that's the case with most of us because what, what is empty in there, what is wanting is uh, this, this hunger for the love of God that we've never seen and we've never experienced. We don't understand that that's the only thing that's going to fill up the emptiness. And uh, as, as we come to Christ, um, something that God has been doing for, for a very, very long time in our life is, is brought to fruition in one sense, but then continues on more. Because there's just one thing that God is doing that happens um, before we come to Christ, as we come to Christ, and later as we grow. God does this one thing in, inside of our soul. He, he reveals himself. That's what God does. And actually, if you think about it, he doesn't do a lot of other things. Um, he is showing himself to us. He, he shows compassion and grace and forgiveness and mercy, and he delivers hope, and we see a little bit of him there, and he delivers wisdom and knowledge and light, and, and we start to see him more clearly. So he, he has this spirit that the Bible calls the spirit of revelation, the spirit of light, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of hope, the spirit of love. And the, the job of the, the Holy Spirit is to bring to us, to bring into the world this delivery of, of revelations of God. And, and so he's down here revealing and showing and demonstrating and, and giving us these glimpses. And then as we put together the glimpses and we start to decide, well, I, I can trust this God, he brings more and more of this revelation. So we, we get this ongoing stream of the work of the Holy Spirit in uh, a manner of very many different revelations of who the person God is. And it draws us to him, and we come into Christ, and then it grows us. It continues after our entry into Christ. And those, those revelations from his word, from God's people, uh, from so many sources, uh, all, all of it a work of the Spirit, are what God uses to bring us to trust him, to love him, to be humble in his presence, to worship him, to have faith in him, and on and on. And so I, I want to talk specifically about this idea that God is revealing himself because his primary means of doing that is through his people. He, he chooses that. He could do it in other ways, and it might be, you know, a little more like fireworks like we had last night, but uh, that's uh, not how he chooses. He, he wants to demonstrate his life and his love and his goodness and his grace through his people into the world, and that's our purpose here. We really don't have another purpose. We are to receive the revelations of God so that our heart is his. You know, it's, it's like Tim said earlier, it's his kindness that leads us. We, the spirit reveals his kindness and we feel it as he forgives us for the sin that, that he shows us that we have. He compares our character to his and we see goodness and holiness in him and we see failure and weakness and sin in us. And it's just that revelation that, that he does on this ongoing basis that leads us to repentance and to a willingness to worship him uh, with a heart that, that loves him because of who he is. And I want to talk today about this idea of 
revelation, not from the standpoint of God revealing himself to us so much as what he is waiting for from us. And that, that is for us to have relations with him, to have a worshiping heart that is so consistently in his presence that he is allowed by our worship to come and use our lives as that light in the world that he has promised he can make of any one of us, no matter how weak, how sinful we are or have been. And, and so I, I, I want to talk today about this idea of what does it take? What, what's God waiting for? Is he wanting us to come and produce light, to produce goodness, to produce love so that the world can see some of those things? Well, he actually isn't waiting for that. He's going to produce that from us. What he's waiting for is this humble heart, this loving heart, this heart of faith in him to come and just be in his presence as we sang about this morning. And it's as we spend that time in his presence presenting ourselves to him, offering who we are and all that we have and all that he's given us and has done in us, we present it back to him. That's actually the, the meaning of the word worship, the verse from uh, uh, Romans 12 that uh, Tim quoted earlier. That it describes this presentation to God as our worship. That's, that's the best definition of worship from the Bible. Giving to God what, whatever you are. You give him your sin, you give him your gifts, you, you give him your time, you give him your relationships, and, and, and you bow humbly and say, here I am. I, I have no love to offer. Love is only found in you. I have no goodness, I have no grace, I have no wisdom, because these things emanate from the person of God. But he has put that person inside of us, and he has formed a union between our spirit and his, and all the fullness of holiness, all the fullness of wisdom, all the fullness of love and of faith and on and on and on dwells inside of us in our spirit through the union of God's Holy Spirit with ours. That's really what happens when we become a Christian. That's the essence of, of how the change is, uh, is made is that his spirit comes in and, and our old spirit is tossed and we get a new spirit and a new heart and that new spirit is in union, in communion, in what the Bible calls koinonia. That's the word for communion, for sharing together, for, for partaking of the same thing, for communication. It's the same word that describes when we take the elements at the communion in church. Um, all, all of those things are described by this one word, koinonia, and it describes this relation that God has established between us and him through which he intends to fulfill his purposes in the world, which is to reveal himself. So that's how God is planning to use you. He purchased you. You are his temple. He bought you as a place to put his spirit here on the earth to live. You go back in the in the Bible, and you see he's got this history of doing that same exact thing over and over and over, just using different entities. He starts with the tabernacle in the desert, and you see that he brings his glory to dwell there, and it's from that tabernacle that he reveals himself out into the world, and the glory of God travels with God's people through the desert, and, and they begin to recognize that there's some sort of a special God there who lives among those people. And then you, you move through the Old Testament a ways and, and the, 
the temple is built by Solomon, and, and the first thing they do is to pray and ask God to come and dwell in the temple. And God brings his glory to be in the temple. And it's from that place, living among his people, living in the midst of his people, that he begins to reveal himself more strongly, more deeply, more broadly to the nations. And he becomes known as a God of love and grace and hope as very distinct from all the other gods of those days. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so you, you see then this progression. You look at Ezekiel chapter 10, and God's finally had it with his people because they've ceased wanting his glory in their presence. They no longer listen to him. They've turned their backs on him, and it's gone on year after year after year. And so Ezekiel chapter 10 describes his removal of his presence from the people. And then for half a millennium, we, we see the world waiting for this return of the dwelling place of God on earth. And it happens then in the body of Christ. You know, it's the first mention in the Bible of what is this next transition going to be in as a physical entity, and it's Christ's physical body. And he says, destroy this temple, and I will raise it back up in three days. And he, he describes himself as being the new temple of God, the place for the dwelling of glory and the revealing of the light of glory into the world. So Christ becomes this temple, but then he is crucified and raised and then takes off and goes up into heaven with his physical body. His physical body is now up there and, and so he said, just wait and we'll get back to continuing this thing that I've been doing through the centuries of establishing a place in the world from which I can reveal myself among the nations. And he does that at Pentecost. The, the glory of God comes to live within his people and he declares them to be the new temple and he, de he declares them not just as a group to be the new temple but also as individuals. You look in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians chapters 6 verse 19 in both, both books and, and one of them describes the body of Christ, all of us together as the temple of the living God. And the other one describes each of us as an individual, as a temple of the living God. So that's who you are if you are in Christ. If you are not in Christ, that's what you were made for. That's what the hungering and the emptiness is about. That's what the thirsting that isn't being quenched is about. You were made to be a temple of the living God. And until that spirit of light comes in, that spirit of glory inhabits you as a person, in, in truth inhabits you. You are not in Christ, and, and if you are not there, you need to talk to someone here, talk to me, talk to Tim, talk to someone who you can see knows uh, the, the light of the gospel of glory. And you need, you need to become that temple of the living God that he created you to be if you ever hope to get rid of the emptiness. But even after we come to God, we so often are not going through life in this worshiping state, saying to God, here I am. I, I'm incapable of any good thing without you. I can't love a person in the way you ask without your love being manifested from your spirit into mine and out into their lives. You know, how many people in the world are just waiting for that one thing? And, and, and most of them don't even know it. Like, like uh, Zach Williams said, uh, I didn't know what it was that I needed to satisfy. That's the description of most of the world. They don't even know what it is they're waiting for, but what they're waiting for is you to love them with the love of God. And he's placed that in you for this purpose. 
He wants to love them. He's planning to do it through your life. He's planning to empower you and grow you and give you the wisdom and the words to speak to them that, that will show them his gentleness, his goodness, his mercy, his grace, that will speak truth about sin, which is the thing standing between them and him. You know, he has every little bit of what they need in order to say, that's the thing I'm hungering for. That's the thing I've been thirsting for, but have been just empty and not knowing where to turn. I've tried all of these other avenues. They haven't worked. You know, we, we tried romance and money and toys, and, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. And we never fill up the emptiness. You know, the, 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 the things that we obtain don't last. Uh, uh, I, I was recently talking to some people who were hoping that uh, the murderer of, of the students down at Moscow would be caught. And, and they're, they're my family members. And uh, because one of the one of the kids that was murdered is uh, my sister's granddaughter. And, and the statement from several people was, well, w when this guy is caught, uh, we'll, we'll have peace. You know, we'll, we'll be comforted. And, and yesterday uh, morning, I was having breakfast with one of the people very closely related to, to Maddie Mogan. And uh, he said, I, I realized as soon as they caught this guy that I'd been thinking wrong. You know, there's no peace in this guy getting arrested. I need to look somewhere else for where I'm going to find that peace. And uh, he does know the Lord. And I said, let's, let's spend some time talking about that this week. But, but the, the truth is we, we don't have within us any good thing except that that the spirit of life the spirit of power the spirit of love the spirit of hope is there within us in in fullness and that God is waiting just like these people all around us who I, I just said a minute ago they're they're waiting they don't know what they're waiting for well God's waiting too and we're the thing in the middle that both of them are waiting for. You know, God is waiting for us to come to him and say, day by day by day and moment by moment, to, to learn to live a life that says, here I am, Lord, spend me. I, I have no other purpose in this life except that you spend me to reveal yourself into that person's life. Or, or to, to be your wisdom for this person over here who's weeping without it, or to, to be a help in a hundred different ways to, to all those people that you know around you who need it and who just go without. They don't, and, and like that song, you know, I had no idea what it was that I was searching for that I was trying to satisfy. They don't know. Well, you know. You know what it is. It's the person, Jesus Christ, in spirit, dwelling inside of you. And, and the offer of his fullness, his power, his light, on and on and on. Uh, everything that Jesus Christ is, is available to you in that spirit if you will humbly worship God. And today I want to talk about what what David called this one thing, what Jesus described in relation to Mary sitting at, at his feet, you know, the, the one thing necessary. Our life really is kind of simple as a believer. God purchases us, and he is all of uh, what is necessary for, do everything, for doing everything that he wants to accomplish through us, but it takes one thing, and that is a worshiping heart. 
a heart that comes into his presence as a way of life, a, a default approach to going day by day by day that says, here I am. You may spend me as you choose. Uh, I'm without goodness except you are here. I'm without understanding and wisdom except you are here. So please come and help me. And there's the prayer of our life. Come. Lord Jesus, and be here to reveal yourself out into the needs of this present darkness. You know, these people, as it says in the, in the prayer about Christ's birth, you know, they, they, people lived in darkness. Well, my goodness, you know, the darkness today is so much darker, I think, than what it was back then. But we live in a, in a dark place and, and Satan truly is the, the prince of the power of the air. And yet Jesus Christ uh, speaks a, a tenth of a word and, and the, the power of Satan melts away before him. And when he, when he has deceived and, and controlled one of these lives that is just our neighbors, our, our family members, the people we work with, everybody you meet all day long, if they are not in Christ, which is most of them, though, those are the people that Satan owns. You know, the Bible says they are his children. And that, that what is going to happen when you allow God to reveal himself to them by his spirit in you is that they will be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, just like we were. That's what happened to us. We got transferred. There's some spiritual kingdoms out there, and there's only two. And one is the kingdom of darkness, and the other is the kingdom of light. And if you are in Christ, you, you belong to the kingdom of light, and, and you are the, the tool, the vessel, through which God intends to reveal his glory into the lives of other people. There's your purpose. And you accomplish that purpose by allowing the Spirit to transform you into the likeness of Christ. That's what the Bible often calls sanctification. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, Jesus has become, and several things, one of them, our sanctification, our holiness, our redemption, our wisdom. And it, it's, it's a wonderful thought. Jesus himself is waiting inside of me to be, by the power of his spirit, revealed out into the lives of these people around me who really are just lacking one thing. You know, they're committing suicide and doing drugs and and chasing after all sorts of things that will never fill up that empty spot in there that is what's bugging them day after day after day to, to be so much in anxiety and worry and turmoil and, and distraught hearts. And you've got what they need. They're waiting on us. And so is God. God waits for us to learn to live a life that walks in the Spirit, a life that receives His abundance, a life that abides in His presence. You know, the Bible describes it in several very wonderful ways. They're all the same thing. We worship in spirit and in truth, and the Spirit of God fills us up and spills out into the world, and he directs and guides and leads us to be his representative lights in this present darkness. God's waiting. The people are waiting. And you, you have, just, just like uh, uh, the prophet in the temple when, when Christ was brought in there by his parents, you know, you... You have this light that shines in the darkness, the light that will be to all nations. It lives in you. You know, God didn't stick it on the top of a Christmas tree. Uh, he didn't put it up, you know, as a banner for people to read. He, he put it 
into your life for people to experience the light of God, the holiness of God, the love of God, the gentleness, the grace of God. It's all in there. And you, you feel like you are inadequate, and, and of course you are. You know, Paul even says, uh, here's the challenge, that we be this light to the nations, that we be God's light to the people. And it, uh, who is, it's, he says, in fact, word for word, who is adequate for such things? But then two verses later, he answers his question. Well, our adequacy is from God in the person of Christ who he has placed within. There is your adequacy for this thing that I'm describing that sounds impossible. How do you get it? How do you get the adequacy of God to come and be played out into the world day by day by day? You worship in spirit and in truth. That's it. That's the one thing. You don't need anything else to be the vessel of God bringing the light of God into the world day by day. You, you, you can't create goodness, and he's not expecting you to. You can't create love, and he's not expecting you to. But you've already been humbled by getting this revealed spirit uh, vision, the spirit-revealed vision of God himself. You've seen holiness in him. You've seen grace in him. You've seen hope and wisdom in him, and on and on and on. And that's what it is going to take, is you just humbling yourself and saying, I've seen you, uh, I, I've seen your holiness, and I, I trust you, I love you, I have faith in you, please come and be whatever you need to be in and through me so that these people around me might know who you are. Fulfill my calling through this communion with you. You know, people talk about calling as if it's a place, as if it's an education, as if it's a job. You know, there's no job in the Bible that's ever described as a calling. There's no place in the Bible that's ever described as a calling. What, what our calling is to in the Bible, the, the primary one is to fellowship, koinonia. The word in the Bible is actually koinonia. We are called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.9, look it up. There's your calling. You're called into koinonia with God. The other things that are mentioned when it, when it talks about calling are all just very simply attributes of Christ. You're called unto faith. You're called unto obedience. You're called unto holiness. You're called unto love. You know, you're just describing the character of Jesus. That's our calling. You're not called to go do some job. I didn't get called to go be a missionary in China. I got called to worship in spirit and in truth, by koinonia with God. That's, that's our calling. That's it. That's what God wants from us. That's what he's waiting for. And when we do that, day by day by day, when we go into the presence of God with that first waking thought in the morning, and we, we make it our default way of life, that when my mind turns on, I, I direct it to him, and I, I remember who he is, and I remember who I am. And th there's humility right there. You see God in truth. You see yourself in truth. You allow the spirit to reveal the truth about God and the truth about you to your heart. And humility is the instant fruit of this work of the spirit. You don't have to go find it. It's just what happens when he reveals himself and he reveals us by a work of the spirit your heart is humbled and you bow down and you say in you alone can, can I hope only to you can I look for what I need you know this one thing that seeking of the presence of 
God, that, that uh, passage in, that David wrote in, in uh, Psalm 27. You know, one thing, and that's really a, a very important phrase, one thing. David, with all that he had and all that he knew God would give him, he says, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. There it is. What happens when, when your heart, you know, whether you're at work or at school or in a group of people talking, when that heart is seeking out this presence of God that is described right there by David and knowing that it's the only thing that's going to fill up that emptiness comes into life when we aren't worshiping and and just speaking to him whether I'm speaking to you or or speaking to someone else I can be speaking with God and saying God help me here you, you have a message to deliver to these people I have no ability to bring it about you know there's there's what's going on in your heart while you're talking to someone a plea to God to overcome the weakness, the lack of understanding, the failure to love. You know, how often am I trying to minister to somebody I don't really love? You know, maybe I got myself up to neutral and I don't hate them anymore. <laughs> but but the, the, tr the truth is that he wants me to love them. And it's only their, that love of God that's going to change them. You know, if they sense that uh, I, I'm having to work hard just to not hate them, it isn't going to draw them into the presence of the living God. But that's not what he's offering. He's offering his gentle, compassionate, loving, gracious, forgiving, merciful love. That's what he gives, and he gives it through you, and he'll bring it right out through your words. He'll show you the verses in the Bible to, to give it to them. He'll help you understand what it is that that particular person needs to hear from him in order to see the love of God through you. That's what he does. That's what he's waiting for. That's what they are waiting for. You know, how many people in your life all around you each day are just waiting for God to love them in this way? And God's waiting to love them, and he's waiting on us to worship in spirit and in truth, to observe that koinonia that David was describing. You know, David is kind of an interesting thing in the Bible because it's the only place where we have uh, this extensive, long bunch of statements where a person is worshiping God in truth and he's speaking truth to God, about God. And it's being delivered into him by the Holy Spirit. And of course, God intended it as a blessing to David. But mostly what he intended it for was as a description of life in the presence of God for all of us. You know, the, the Psalms are God's demonstration to what it looks like for a person to go about a, a, a bit a very busy life of a king while still maintaining this relationship with God that delivered the, the power and humility and goodness of God into his life day by day. Well, that's what that's there for. And I want to talk in a minute about, <clears throat> excuse me, how, how do we use not just these messages from David that the Holy Spirit used him to write down about how to have this koinonia with God and what it looks like, but all the rest of the Bible as well. And I, I think uh, being that it's January 1st, even though uh, the pastor said it's not okay to do resolutions, um, if we can do something else, we'll just make a suggestion like the Bible has done. You know, read your Bible this year. Why don't you ask God the Spirit if he would give you 
the strength and the understanding to go through your Bible this year and to do a very specific thing, uh, a growth process. This is a, an assignment we use to help Chinese and African and Brazilian church leaders grow their own spiritual lives. All they've got is the Bible and the Holy Spirit. And amazingly enough, that's all they need. They don't need us sitting there with them. They need the Bible and the Holy Spirit. And you've got the same thing. And you've got this spirit who's chomping at the bit to grow you into the likeness of Christ and to reveal the light of God to the nations through your life. And, of course, uh, you don't feel adequate for that. But as Paul said, God is our adequacy. He's, he's in there, re ready to do all of the work of it, other than the worshiping in spirit and in truth. And so you, you read through the Bible, and you mark um, off three things. Uh, uh, I, I initially did it by just marking with a colored pen, you know, uh, one of those highlighter things. Every place where something um, talks about who God is or what he does or what he promises. So you're going to read through the whole Bible, trying to find every verse that describes who God is, what he does, and what he promises. It actually, uh, people who do it come away from the assignment saying, that grew my faith. I, I, I only completed the first tiny little part of the assignment, but it grew my faith, it grew my love for God, it grew my humility in God's presence, and it makes me want to get up in the morning and go back into his presence. And that's what happens. And you, you see God. You, it, it's interesting. You, you don't believe anything new at the end of the year of going through the Bible and outlining all these things. You already believe all that stuff. You believe every bit of it already. So the idea is not we're trying to get you to believe these things. You already believe them. We could read them off here one by one. And occasionally somebody might raise their hand wondering whether or not they actually believe it. But the truth is, almost all of you believe 100% of every one of those verses that you're going to mark. What is needed is to then ask God to make this a way of life for you. A, a, a foundation of worship and praise and submission and humility in the presence of God that not only takes you there with that attitude, but, but brings about that love that it takes to want to do this. You know, so, so often we tell people to, you know, to be good, to do the right thing. Well, you know, for, for kids, maybe that's a good instruction for a while, but the point is it doesn't work. People grow up and adults recognize that uh, I don't want to do the right thing. I don't want to do what's good, and I, I don't have that motivation. But as Tim was saying earlier, it's God's kindness, his graciousness, his goodness, his love, his mercy that leads us into this repentance that allows him to transform us into being someone that Paul describes as having incorruptible love. You know, the, the word corruption means it, it decays, it, it, uh, it breaks down. And, and this word means it, it doesn't decay, it doesn't break down, it doesn't rot. The word means to rot. And this, this is love that doesn't do that. And that's what God builds into us when we learn to have a life that worships in spirit and in truth as a default approach to daily life. When, when, when we do it, he grows us into this love and faith and humility that persists, that stays it, it doesn't go away. It doesn't break down. It doesn't disappear. It, it stays there. 
That's how God grows into you this default approach that worships in spirit and in truth and you your your mind kind of clears up a little bit in the morning and 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 the first thing that needs to go through your head as God has done his work is I'm here Lord I I have another day it it's yours lead me into a time of worship this morning that very distinctly ensures that all of today, every moment, is yours to control. And it's my love for you because of your love for me that's going to control me. That's the only thing that works. You know, saying, I'm going to be good. I'm, I'm going to not drink anymore. I'm going to quit being angry at this group of people who I don't like. It doesn't work. But it's your love for God that empowers his spirit to control you. And that's what he does. The love of God controls us. You, you get back into his presence. You, you read what he has promised you about what he will do and how he will do it. You read about his character and his nature and you, you over and over and over, you see that, and, and his spirit comes and reveals it in a much deeper way into your inner person. And your inner person gets convinced that God loves and that there isn't something you can say or do that will move that love into being smaller. It's just this great, big, abundant, overwhelming love that is not dependent on your weakness and your sin, the blood of Christ paid for that. So there's one thing to do this next year, the same as David's one thing, the same as Mary's one thing, the same as Paul's one thing. And he says, one thing I do. And that is to learn what it means to worship in spirit and in truth. And God is waiting for you to just say to him, I don't know how to worship in spirit and in truth. I don't have a life that gets up in the morning and comes into your presence and does that. Help me. Give me the love for you. Give me the faith in you. Give the hum me the humility in your presence that leads me to have that life that is controlled by you moment by moment through each day. And you, you do this even just for a year. I, I do this with pastors for a year, and then I take them out to dinner with their wife, and I say, uh, tell me about his spiritual life today compared to a year ago. And they say, oh, my goodness, you know, this is a different man. And, and of course, he, he feels like he's still failing. But the truth is, God is moving in and by the Spirit displacing, using the attributes of Christ, the nature of Christ. You know, 2 Peter chapter 1, chapter 1 says that divine nature of Jesus is available to us. The divine nature of Christ is ours here on the earth in this life. He wants it to be established in you by a work of the Holy Spirit every moment and every day, the nature of Christ. And that's what he wants to do. And it doesn't matter when we feel inadequate for it. God is our adequacy. So the blood of Christ has purchased all of this and established it in you if you are in Christ, and most of you probably are. You know, Tim's making sure that the Holy Spirit's doing his work in you. And so there's the one thing to do this next year, to learn in a, in a deeper and deeper way what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth, which Jesus told the woman at the well was the one thing the Father was seeking. He says it twice right there, John, John 4, 23 and 24. That's what 
the Father seeks, that we would worship in spirit and in truth. One thing, and you, you, can, you can give this next year to that one thing, and, and what it does is bring the power of, from the spirit of power, as he is called, to transform you into being day by day and by day by day more like Christ, by his strength and by his goodness more like him. So I, I want to challenge you, maybe, maybe take some time to go into the presence of God and make that commitment to him that says, I, I need you to complete this transformation into Christ-likeness so that you can use me for what I was called for, for what you intend to do with me, to reveal your light from my life as much as I don't feel like that can happen through me. It's what you're saying, and it's what you've promised, and it's what you're capable of. It's your work, my worship. Teach me to worship. Teach me to have that life that wakes up in the morning with a heart that loves God enough that just says, I want to worship now, and I want it to continue all day long. So I want to ask you right now to, to just bow your head, and if you feel you can do that in sincerity, ask God to use this next year and the rest of your life to grow you more and more and more into that likeness of Christ that he intended for each one of us. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would pour out your spirit into this place in a mighty way that is surely uh, the way that your nature would do, the only way that your nature wants to produce. You want to produce Christ-likeness in abundance and in holiness and in power and in grace. Lord, pour out a, a measure of your love in this place that the, the people of this city will be able to do nothing other than stand up and say, my, what, what's happening? What, what is it that we're seeing here in our midst? And, and let it be your light and your love and your goodness and your grace that is your desire for each person in, in, in North Idaho to, to know through these people. And I thank you for them. I believe that your spirit is dwelling here in this place, and we ask that you would pour out another great measure, a, a greater measure than what is here now, that, that your light might, in fact, be revealed here in special ways day by day by day through each temple of your spirit. We praise you. We proclaim Jesus Christ to, to be the, the only God and our God, our Lord, our King. And we bless his name and we pray in his name. Amen.